Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the Dark Diaspora Africa Renaissance channel. Your host once again, Ego, and I have with me His Royal Highness Namdi. How you doing, mate? I'm fine, man. Uh, good evening, everyone. Good afternoon and good morning, wherever you are. Yes, yes. <clears throat> Time now in the UK is 10.05, Friday, the 25th of May. Uh, by the way, happy Africa Day, happy Africa Unity Day, happy Africa Liberation Day, whichever you may call it. Um, that would be another show, but uh, obviously being the first show of the evening, we just thought it would make more sense to acknowledge that. Um, but we'll get into that uh, later. Okay, I'll get straight into it. Today's topic is NFL and NBA, time to rumble in the jungle. Uh, this is a bit of a kind of um, uh, mis mysterious or mis mystical, um, not mis mystical, mysterious title. Um, it's one that came about from the recent um, policy that was implemented by the NFL uh, to give a background knowledge on the topic. The NFL obviously. Um, Colin Kaepernick, uh, a black player who um, you would have seen him somewhere, sports are really big, you know, um, haircut, uh, decided during the national anthem that they play before every match to kneel instead of standing and putting his hand on his chest. So he took a knee in protest at the police brutality that was being perpetrated on, uh, upon black people in the United States. Subsequently, a lot of other black players started following suit and it became a bit of a trend. And then the powers that be, some powers that be and fans alike complained and started um, trying to find a way of making players stand, but they really couldn't because it it's, it's pretty much their own choice. Um, they are being paid to play a sport, not necessarily to stand the national anthem. So recently, uh, or not recently, Trump made a few comments saying, you know, if he was the owner of those teams, they should kick those players out of them, tell them to get out, get up, or get out of there, or leave the club, and made some kind of very, um, uh, you know, abrasive comments, which I feel weren't his place to make, but he made them anyway. And then now, more recently, I think in the past week or so, they have now. Um, decided to impose fines on anyone who doesn't stand during the national anthem and give them an option. Oh, no, not who fine, fine you if you don't stand, fine you if you kneel during the national anthem. And if you don't wish to stand, then you can go to the locker room. So they basically told them that you have no right to protest or to show your own way of responding to the national anthem. You must stand. Uh, and you must um, obey those rules. I'll go back to Colin Kaepernick because since he made that move, he has now been dropped by his team and not been hired by any other team and has just continued his new career now of activism and he's no longer a, an NFL player. Um, other players still do it, but since this new policy came into play, um, everyone's keeping an eye out on those who are still going to be doing it and, or not. Um, I think there's only one team uh, owner who says he's, he's going to absorb the fines and not uh, fine his players. Um, but majority of the other ones are going to abide by the new policy and fine players because apparently the club and the player will be fined if they see people who don't stand for the national anthem. Um, so Saying that, this now brought us to think um, or to have a look at the NBA as the black players and um, how thinking of a way that they could um, be free to express themselves, be free to apply their trade, not to be disrespected or, or to be rejected their own um, political views wherever they see fit. Um, Coincidentally, America is, is purported as the, um, the country with the 
most um, um, vulnerable freedom of speech uh, and protections. At the same time, they are trying to stifle people's freedom of expression and speech or demonstration. Um, so it's a bit of a contradiction. But focusing on the black players, wanted to talk about what it is um, they face, what it is they can do, what alternatives they have, and what um, what next for black players in those leagues context in um, how Americans will treat this sort of um, uh, control or, or manipulation or stifling of dissent or stifling of expression. So I wanted to see what your views, first of all, Nandi, were on the whole topic before we delve into other matters. Well, um... I didn't quite get what you said the last time. Oh, I said, um, I said, um, saying that given the whole, um, the whole preface, I said, I wanted to see what your thoughts were on the whole issue of the protest, the taking a knee and what, uh, Trump has said in response to those things and what new policy the NFL has employed. I think taking the knee is justified. It's, yeah, it's a, ju a justifiable way of bringing attention to the injustices um, plaguing black black people in America. I mean, so we just lost some connection with Namdi. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, yeah, sorry about that. So um, I think it's just um, the taking on me is a justifiable way of drawing um, attention to um, the injustices plaguing black people in America. I think it's been going on now for about two years, and um, um, that's succeeded in drawing a lot of attention to. Um, the injustices surrounding police brutality and the mass incarceration of um, of black people. I mean, I myself have only um, and the begin to see the um, the extent of such um, um, brutality, such injustices played out on American streets. I've seen videos. Of one on 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 armed black men that have been shot, um, for no for no reason for flimsy reasons. Um, so, Colin Kaepernick was using his position as an as an NFL player to draw as a quarterback NFL player to draw attention to this plight, and I think he started this um, movement. A little bit over two years ago, but since the Trump administration came into power, it's, ob it's obvious that um, um, attempts have been made to stifle that protest. So this latest attempt uh, to silence dissent is um, also one in a series of attempts that have been made to curb this. Um, ongoing protest by Cop Kaepernick and other black NFL players. So I think it's quite unfortunate. It's quite unfortunate that um, after 400 years of having African Americans living in America, that they still have to be subjected to such inhumane, dastardly, barbaric and savagery acts that we see play out on national TV. Um, they are essentially being treated as second class citizens in their own country. I think it's shameful. For a country that parades itself as the home of the free and land of the brave, and then um, they are actively taking steps to silence people who have genuine concerns 
about how they've been treated. And you know, I think for our viewers who are who are watching, and this is not the first time this has been happening. It's been happening in the US over and over and over again. Anytime a group of people who are being oppressed use their position to begin to draw attention to what they're going through, the government or the authorities and government respond with some hefty and harsh sentences. We saw this a similar we saw this same thing happen in the 70s when two black americans who were representing america i believe it was the uh, the olympics forgotten what their name were well, i forgotten what the name of the gentleman i forgot the name of the gentleman but i think his first name starts with carlos when he gave a, a black power salute oh yes yeah. Um, during the uh, Olympics in the U.S. And, uh, you know, there was, there was a, there, there was a, you know, the, the response, the response by the U.S. government was swift and quick. And I think, um, John Carlos. man, Just yeah, yeah, John Carlos and 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 and, and, and Tommy Smith gave gave the Black Power salute in 1968 in the 1968 Olympics. You know, again they were protesting a similar thing that is currently happening today, more than 50 years after, or close to 50 years after. Yeah, over 50 yeah, over 50 years after, the situation has still not changed. Muhammad Ali did the same thing too. He did the same thing. He said he wasn't going to go to Vietnam to fight because he didn't like the way the, the way his people were being treated in America. And what did the government do? They responded by stripping him off his belt and preventing him from practicing boxing in the U.S. So this is something that's been going on for uh, you know for a long time. It's just, just not, it's not not new. It just this Kaepernick issue is not it's not new. It's something that's ongoing and has been ongoing for more than 50 years, or half a century. And, I, and, I, and at some point, you just begin to ask yourself, you know, does, does the government actually mean well for black people in America? I think at some point, black people in America need to ask themselves that question. I don't know if they are watching this, this, this clip, but at some point, if you are watching this video, at some point, you will just say enough is enough. Enough is enough. Can they continue like this? Can they continue to be treated this way they are being treated? Can they put up with these shenanigans for another 50 to 100 years? I think that a paradigm shift is needed. And one of the solutions that I propose will be for them to look towards Africa. And I'll be talking about this extensively as we progress in the show. So I don't know if you have anything to say in the interim. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've, uh, on, on, the, on, on, on the point of saying you think it's time for them to look at Africa. Now, now let, let, let's take a look at that. It's time for them to look at Africa. I've had some conversations with uh, some African-American friends, colleagues, and the overriding theme that keeps coming up is how can they can they reconnect they don't know people on the continent people on the continent haven't reached out to them um, the governments haven't introduced any policies to invite them or bring them back um, the disconnect there through media manipulation and um, um, you know, brainwashing and, and 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 decisive, you know, strategic policies that have made, been made over time to make sure that the bond is broken um, have played their part. But a lot of people feel that they don't know how to begin. They don't know how to how to reach out and cross that divide. So it's rendered them in this place where 
they feel they can only fight for what they feel is rightfully theirs, which is a point. Um, but that fight has been going on now for it's almost over 500 years. And with people like Louis Farrakhan, who at the time, and others obviously like him at the time, the Nation of Islam, um, offered an alternative to, to, the, to the struggle in trying to get them to fight for their own piece of land within America. So I think on the face of it, that is the dream because it's fighting for equality or justice is, is just a natural instinct, but for a solution, integration obviously hasn't worked. So now separation is looking more and more appealing. But then is it likely to have a separation within the United States? What do you think? Nandi, what do you think? Okay, I can't hear from Nandi right now. Um, I, I stopped at saying a separation. What is the likelihood of separation within the United States being possible? Um, pretty slim. But looking into the future, in the future we have a growing population um, of Mexicans or Latinos or Latin Americans growing growing in the US to a point that is projected that they will be the majority in the country. And it's not going to be so far in the future. Now, if that if those projections are correct, and they are going to be the majority. Uh, some would obviously say that most of the land is there anyway to begin with, California in particular, Texas, and other places. So what would be the likelihood of the state of African Americans when this becomes the case, when the, the powers that have sub subjugated them for so long become a lesser majority and that the ones who now rise and become the majority would inevitably seize power. When they do seize power, what do the African Americans think will happen then? I think they will start having a struggle with the Latinos again. And that will go on for another potential half millennium. Because every group wants to have power. And if every group has more of the potential attributes and uh, wherewithal to have power, then they will take it and not share it. They won't share it. So the game that is being played does not suit African Americans in any way, medium, short, or long term. The only solution that I believe they should be looking towards is looking to reconnect back with Africa. They should be looking to reconnect back with Africa. Um, and that is the only way. And then the, the, the retort is, well, our ancestors built this country is true. Our ancestors built this country. We want our fair share. Even if some say, even if we are to leave, we want our fair share before we go. Okay, they say that. But then who is going to give you that? They haven't given it till now. They, it's obvious they're not going to give it. And then by the time power switches hands from the white the Caucasians to the Latinos or the Mexicans, it's going to start all over again because they have, they would have just tasted power and they are going to hold on to it 
enjoy it, proliferate it, and engender it for their future generations. They're not going to look and say, oh, you suffered for so long. We feel sorry for you. Um, here, have some, obviously there will be some sharing of some sort, but ultimate power will belong to them. Ultimate power will belong to them. So, as Namdi was saying, I feel the, the, the long game should be looking at Africa. But now back to the NFL and NBA. Um, Namdi, are you still there? Are you back? Yes, I'm here. I'm here. Okay. Um, well, first of all, before I get back into the NFL and NBA, is there anything you want to add on that? Or I'll continue. 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 Go ahead. Okay. Um, now back to the NFL and NBA. Um, I'll just read some statistics. The NBA um, in 20, um, let me see, 2015, 2016 season um, was worth $6.5 billion. Right, that was in the 2015, 2016 season. So looking now towards the 2017, 2018, I, I've checked again, it's expected or it was worth around eight billion, over $8 billion. So it's rising. It's a very large, um, a large league, um, a lot of cash, a lot of money, a lot of sponsorships, um, a lot of TV rights and revenue. So it's a very large revenue making um, um, sport, that's the NBA. Um, and the proportion of the players in the NBA that are black are about 75% of the NBA. So 75% of the NBA is black players, 23% is white players, and 1.8 is Latino players, and 0.2 is Asian players. Now I'll look to the NFL. The NFL generates about, I'll get the numbers. The NFL generated in 2016, about $8 billion, about $8 billion. Um, I think uh, one of the teams, the Packers, um, who own the, and that's the, they're the only publicly owned franchise in major U.S. sports, uh, reported revenues of $244 million. And that's up, and this was last year, and that's up from $226 million the previous year. So they're worth $8 billion as, as of 2016. So we're looking like towards $10 billion or so. So it's a larger money-making re revenue stream or revenue sport than the NBA. It's the largest one in the U.S. The percentage of players in the NFL that are Black is between 70 and 80 percent. So it was 75 percent for NBA. Um, it's close to 80 percent for an NFL. Almost 80 percent of NFL. Um, I say this to, to say that if Black players aren't in any of those two sports, you don't have those two sports in the United States. It's pretty much non-existent. Now, rather than be vilified or standing up for causes that they believe in, that threaten their livelihood, their family members, friends, and them as a people, wouldn't it be more sensible and smart and strategic to start to think of creating a league on their own? Now, creating a league on their own in the US is not going to be easy. In fact, it wouldn't be allowed. The US, I'm sure they would um, they would cease sponsorship and they would have everyone pretty much pull back from them and try and punish them and try and make them come back. But that's what would happen. That, that's easily foreseeable. Um, but then Nambi and I kept thinking of ways they could 
still have their leagues with those percentage of players outside that system still generating revenue. Um, before I proceed, first of all, Nandi, do, do you, um, given those figures, what do you what do you have to say about that? The figures I just rolled out. I said the figures are really astonishing, to say the least. What, 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 what do you think that, that shows, first of all? It shows because that in it shows that well, I mean the black players have the the, you know they have the they have the they have they have the talent they are the resource okay yeah we know that most of the owners of the 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 the, the, the football clubs are white i think with the exception of one that's owned by an indian person but they have the resources so i see no reason why they should not do something about it i see no reason but then I can understand that the system they are operating is a very oppressive system. It's a racist system. So even if they try to start, start up their own league, it's not gonna, it's not gonna be as easy as you know, one is thinking it's gonna be. It's not gonna be that easy. You need publicity. You need, you need view, uh, sponsorship. You need viewers. You need an, uh, you whole, you need a whole new industry, backing you up. And you cannot just create an alternative system. And expect to just flourish like that. It doesn't have. It doesn't work like that. In a racist, in a deeply racist country like the United States. So I think that, just like you highlighted earlier on, the best option, and I don't know if African Americans have come to this realization, is for them to take this their talent to Africa, and begin to develop it. This I think is the best option for them. NFL is still in its infancy in a lot of African countries. But there is talent there. There is the talent there. 70 to 80 percent of the NFL players are African Americans. And African Americans that have their ancestry from Africa. So that shows you that that the talent to develop the NFL is on the African continent. It's just that the sport itself has not been developed in most African countries. This is where these ex-NFL players can come in. They can go and partner with a, a number of African countries and begin to, to develop the sports there. Develop the sports there and begin to broadcast it around the world. I think they should begin to look at, look, look at this option. I've heard them talk about creating an alternative um, league to compete with the NFL, I don't think it's going to be as easy as they are thinking it's going to be. Trust me, I don't think it's going to be as easy as they are thinking. Just create your own league and just run your own league like that. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. In a deeply racist country like the United States, I don't think it's going to work that way. Because you're not just opening your own league. You need other things, other apparatus that you don't have control over to see, to see it work. So, secondly, African Americans say they don't want to go to Africa because they've built so much in America. But you, you've been treated like, like shit. Follow my friends. They've continued to treat you people like shit for more than 400 years. Like second class citizens. I mean, can you imagine watching in 2018 an African American being shot on, on national TV or international TV? People around the world have seen those images. Of black people being shot by police, shot in the back, shot at close range, shot in front of their children, even shot in their own house. You know, we know that the 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 the, 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 the levels of the law doesn't seem to always work in favor of African Americans. You know, so it's a deeply racist system that they have operating operating there that, you know, does not favor people of color. So I don't know why African-Americans are not beginning to look at this option. I mean, some of them have begun to look at this option. I'm aware about some of them that have immigrated to Ghana, you know. And I think a lot of them need to start looking at that option. A lot of them need to start looking at that, looking at Africa as an option for them. Because I think that's where their future lies. I, mean, I don't know what your thoughts are, though. No, no, I, I, I agree. Um, 
uh, obviously there would be there would be some you know hesitation risk pitfalls but i think on the face of it they weigh they they outweigh the the continuation of the, of the state of, of, of affairs as as they currently are they outweigh they outweigh that i mean all you have to look at is those who are living in ghana today which number the tens of thousands currently uh, i mean if anyone needs to find out about any testimonials as to as to how the integration has worked that should be the perfect uh, conduit by which they can go go to find out exactly how you can integrate and exactly what life is like what you need what the transition is like how they adapt uh, the the the, the a adaptation um, in, into the culture or the systems have worked things to look out for things to expect uh things to um, um get used to things you'd have to drop behind they can hear it from the voices of the people who have made that move before them the pioneers that's all it takes and they're pioneers in ghana in south africa and uh, liberia and some other parts that we don't hear of but the more prevalent ones we hear of are those countries i just listed so it's not a scary um it's, it's, it's not, not or should not be a scary thing to 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 think that how would i do it how would i make this this work you know i think sometimes people just need to just do it they need to do it for some it won't work and for some it will but you never know till you do but then i had the the article up just now i think um i, I didn't get to mention it which was for uh jay ajay he he's a british national but originally he's Nigerian who played for plays for the Philadelphia Eagles who won the Super Bowl last year so I put this up to try to show that the possibility for NFL to penetrate the sporting um, landscape in Africa is already there you have players like like him and ex-players as well, I've, I've, I've forgotten his name. He's now a pundit. Um, he's now a pundit. Uh, I've forgotten his name. I'll get his name up now. Ex Osi, yes, there, here, here he is. Osi Umenyora. He's another uh, Nigerian ex NFL player who's retired now, but he's now a pundit. Um, so these could be ambassadors to spread the word of NFL and get it embedded into the country's psyche. Um, if, if, it, if NFL could come to the UK, because UK, uh, just a few years ago, they started to have uh, one of the season games in the NFL in the UK, or Wembley Stadium in London. So they play just one game from um their league so it's a real live game not an exhibition game a real live game from their league they'll come up play in the uk and that was a kind of promotional exercise to get people into it and it worked people now start watching nfl even though it gets shown like around 2 a.m in the morning or whatever time people get up and watch it and now they start getting sponsorships and tv deals and rights and money it's now on the um on pay-per-view or um, uh, um, um channels Sky or, or um, uh, uh, Virgin or, or what have you. So I'm, I'm trying to say that because NFL traditionally and historically has not been in a particular region does not mean it cannot work there. If Africans know that these players are their own, look like that, and this new beautiful, amazing, physical, gladiatorial sport is being played before them. I know there is football, soccer, which Americans call it football, which pretty much has the country on hold. It is the greatest sport on the African continent. But every juggernaut can be challenged. Every single one can be challenged. And what better way to challenge it with another juggernaut as the NFL? So in summary, I feel, and Nandi agrees with me, that the NFL and the NBA, with the majority players they have, can go and apply their trade in Africa if the United States would put 
obstacles in their way to prevent them having their own league. They already have the money. They have the backing. There are some wealthy people among them. Jay-Z has a, has a team, the New York um, um, Jets or New Jersey Jets. Uh, some other people are trying to buy some team. Michael Jordan has a team. And now we've got you back. Yeah, I would say that Michael Jordan has a team. Jay-Z has a team. Uh, and some other people are part um, owners or, 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 or also co-owners of, of some other teams and franchises. So why not? Why not take your teams and franchises to Africa? Why not take them to Africa? Because all the reasons that people would cite was, oh, infrastructure is not on the ground. We don't have the stadia. You don't have the media organizations to cover uh, and what have you. But all those can be created. All those are just investments. Banks would, would back those people. Banks on the continent would back those teams. They would back that league. They would back them. They would create it and create the stadia, create the infrastructure, and beam it around the world. Beam it worldwide. People will tune in and watch. Even those in the United States will still tune in to watch those players. That's what will happen. And you can make Africa the center for mega sports on the con on the planet on the planet that's what they, they could do and finally to give this whole topic context to give it all context of why and how this can work that's why the title i named it rumble in the jungle in 1974 similar issues Muhammad Ali for his views against the war in Vietnam uh, and his um, dissatisfaction or disaffection with how his people were being treated uh, during the civil rights movement. Muhammad Ali was stripped of his titles and ability to box in the United States. He was stripped of his ability to box in the United States and of his title. He didn't sit down and say, I'm going to stay in the United States and not do anything and just fight perpetually. He decided, I'm going to have this fight, work with people on the ground and also in the United States. And they went over to Kinshasa Zaire in, and had arguably one of the greatest boxing matches in history. Muhammad Ali fought George Foreman. When Muhammad Ali was a bit older, George Foreman was a rising star, the heavy hitter, and Muhammad Ali was was you know poised to lose that match by every other kind of metric and every measure and every um, every kind of odds out there. But he put on a spectacle, beat George Foreman, and it made history. And everyone knows what, all the rest about that. We see here that the fight at that time, 1974, grossed $100 million, inflation adjusted to $496 million in worldwide revenue. World, worldwide revenue. So I'm putting this to show context and precedence that if you are stifled in the United States, and this does not have to do with sport, if you are stifled, if you are mistreated, if you are abused, subjugated, uh, uh, um, have prejudice uh, upon you um, and your group of people, you don't have to take it. Africa is the option. In two leagues where you are the dominant force with skill, power, numbers, and financial wealth as well, and you decide to stay amidst all of this, then there's no one, else, no one else to blame. You can take these leads, take yourselves in numbers, agree, hold a meeting, union, and take yourselves to Africa and set up the leads there and have your great show for the world to see. We have sports. America, American football is, is gaining sp uh, speed in China. So you're not going to tell me if you leave the United States and you go and play in Africa, the Chinese won't watch. They will watch. In Europe, they'll watch. And the Americans will still watch. So that's what I'm just trying to say, that sometimes we, we can feel we're in a 
situation or position where there's no way out, but there's always a way out. It might be the inconvenient way out, but it's still a way out. It's a, it's a, it could be a way out where you, you can't envision what the other side would look like, but it's still a way out. And the final thing I want to say before I pass back to Nandi is some people have taken some steps to create their own leagues. Ice Cube, the West Coast um, um, rapper turned, um, turned um, movie director, started his own league. And his own league is a basketball league but that has uh, the senior, so ex-players, ex-veterans who are playing against each other, three on three. And he started that league and it's growing. It's growing, but this is in, within the US. So people can take the initiative. People have the financial backing and they can even get further financial backing with wealthy investors and banks in Africa. So there's no reason this cannot be done. It just takes willpower, ambition and vision. Um, Nandi, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, I agree. I agree with what you said. I agree with what you said. They, um, they just need to look towards Africa. I, you know, with all the things that we've said today and all the analysis that we've provided, Africa just appears to be their best option. They've been going round and round in circles and we don't see any end in sight. They've protested. They've taken a knee for crying out loud. Just a knee. They're not doing anything. Just take the knee. Finish. Not marching on the streets. They're not being violent. They're not taking up arms. They're not taking up a knee. And the government is, 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 you know, is taking this kind of harsh stand on them. So I just think that, you know, it's high time they, they look at two options. One, we begin to look at option or they begin to look at economic boycott. They should remember that it was the economic boycott that drew the attention to the issue of segregation during, uh, uh, during the civil rights era. The, Mont the Montgomery bus boycott. They should remember it's, it was called Mon the Montgomery boy 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 uh, bus boycott for a reason. For a reason, that's what it was called but the Montgomery boys, uh, boycott. Apartheid didn't end because people felt that, oh, it was morally wrong. Apartheid ended because people decided to put an economic stranglehold on it. Exactly. Okay, so it didn't end because people thought, oh, it was morally wrong. How can they, how can a few white people rule over uh, the, the dominant black people? This is the same thing that happened during slavery. Slavery didn't end because people felt it was morally wrong. Slavery ended because a lot of people they began to sell that they, some people found that it was not economically viable. There were slave revolts across the plantation, across most of the plantations. It, to manage the plantation business with, with the slaves was becoming something that was overwhelming. So they needed to look at other ways of you know conducting their business with minimal disruption. And just to show you that slavery did not end because people felt it was morally wrong. Shortly after slavery ended, they went to China and took Chinese slaves to replace African slaves. They, they went and enslaved, they went and captured Chinese people and used them to begin to work on plantations in the Caribbean. This story is not, often not told. And took some of them to the United States to go and work, after which they banned them chase them and, and ban the Chinese from coming into the U.S. They instituted a law called the Chinese Exclusion Act that prevented the Chinese from coming into America. So this, America has a, a, a history of very racist policies that have inflicted on people. Very racist and they said a leopard never loses his sports. And this is the thing that, it's an African proverb that said a leopard never loses his sports. And this is what African Americans need to understand. They say, when somebody shows you who they are, believe them. Okay? For them to just think that America will one day have an epiphany and just, oh, what we've been doing to these people are just wrong. We need to change course. It's never going to happen. It, it, it's it reminds, never. 
it reminds me of something someone says the, the only two things that they understand is economic violence and, and money violence yeah those are the only two things that that's the only two things that the white man understands violence and money so you boycott economic boycotts if they can organize themselves then they carry out a mass boycott of the nfl of the nba until something happens i guarantee you something immediately happen so if they cannot do that then they should look towards africa there are two things kneeling marching protesting all that's not going to work just forget about it it's not going to work we've seen it in the past all you just need to look at look at we can take roll calls of of, of jack johnson of muhammad ali of uh john carlos and other people who've done things similar in the past nothing happened to those people they pounced on them heavily so so that's the thing two options boycott yeah yeah boycott or you should move to africa so for my african-american brothers that are watching this broadcast those are the two options that i think that are available to them boycott or you should look towards africa finish i agree i, agree. I, th I think and, and finally um to 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 finish on that you said they, they, they need to boycott or look to africa uh the, the some some would say the third option would be to go to war but that really is, isn't an option you know they are numbered they don't they don't hold a monopoly on violence somebody um, said we should go to war no 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 i i was saying the um obviously there would be a third option which would be to go to war but that's not an option at all because um that's that would be that would be futile that would be futile so um forget that option um the only the final thing i wanted to add was i feel people in a position in status such as louis farrakhan has been pumping out the wrong message um for so long and has made people think that somehow that dream is a, it can be a reality one day of having their own land within the united states As i think some people are still holding on to that dream but it's a fantasy it's it's a, it's a fantasy and the only options are what we just said boycott or start looking at africa as a real option now for changing their their situation their, their justice situation the economic situation their living situation it's the only way and they really need to start looking at it and people need to start giving the right message i think farrakhan has given his message his whole life he's now coming towards the end of his life i think if he wants to do anything for the people of the united states he needs to start or the black government say he needs to start giving a different message now a different message so his legacy will not be one um which in essence didn't do much for his people didn't do much for his people but um i don't know what you think about that what your views are um let us know if you disagree we'd like to know as well if you agree um hit the like button subscribe uh, send us your questions, comments, uh, things you liked about the show, things you didn't like about the show, and um, suggestions for any future shows. And um, yeah, we'd like to hear from you. So until next time, thanks for watching. Peace.